Media coverage provided by the CyberWire. Our popular daily cybersecurity news brief and daily podcast are online at thecyberwire.com. We are able to help extend the reach of the 2017 Women in Cybersecurity Conference keynotes thanks to the generous support of our sponsors. IBM. Silence and CyberSec Jobs. Good morning. How is everybody doing? Yeah, good morning. Come on. I'm delighted to be here today and honored to host this Q&A session. Now, I know mornings are tough, right? And on top of everything, you need to deal with my Israeli accent. Nevertheless, in true women in tech fashion, we are persistent, we are determined to keep you engaged, we have coffee, and we are bringing, bringing technology to our aid. So we invite you to submit live questions to our speaker through the event app using the hashtag AskMary. My name is Amita Lazari, I'm a doctoral student at Berkeley Law and a fellow at CTSP Berkeley School of Information. So I'm a woman in tech, and we too in tech law would love to have you in our community. So please consider also the legal career path. Now we all know that we are facing a diversity crisis in cybersecurity. Recently, a survey reported that only 21% of executives in tech are women. This despite evidence that more women that's you guys, <laughs> lead to more innovation and more profits. So the real question is why? Well, this survey identifies the five biggest barriers for women in tech. Lack of mentors, lack of female role models, gender bias in the workplace, unequal growth opportunities, unequal pay for the same skills. Now, Please raise your hand if you ever experienced one or more of these barriers. I know I definitely did. Come on, don't leave me alone here. Okay, so while this conference is making a huge progress, there is still work to be done. So how should we personally and as a community deal with these findings? Well, let's find out. Our goal today is to give you practical, real-world advice so you will be able to thrive and take positions of leadership. We will host today one of the, of the leading female role models in cybersecurity, Mary De Grazia. Mary will share with us from her personal experience in leadership positions. She is a director at Qual Cybersecurity, a published author, and a technical editor for industry-related publications. Recently, her blog was listed as one of the top 10 blogs in, in digital forensics. Well, it's clear. We can all benefit from your advice, Mary. So let's go ahead and get this conversation started. First, I'm sure our audience would like to hear a little more about your background. Tell us a little more about your current position and what was the journey that led you to this executive position. Hello, can everybody hear me okay? I am, first of all, let me say I am so thrilled. When I started out, in the technology field 14 years ago, I never would have dreamed that I could have walked into a conference like this and see so many women. As I was going through my college studies, I would walk in, and I'm sure as many of you feel, there would just be one or two of us. And I was so excited. I stood up in the back and I took a picture and I'm like, this is amazing, this is incredible. Like, our daughters are gonna have futures in this industry, it's fantastic. Um, I also like to think, as I was listening to these other keynote speakers, we all have very different backgrounds. When I was at the Kroll booth yesterday and listening to the people that were coming up and talking, I would listen to people that were students, PhDs, people that were looking for a change into a different career field, a different focus. And I think this diversity really can help tie us together. And I just kind of wanted to share with you my journey and how I got into my field. Um, my start really was due to my father. He brought home an Apple II Plus computer. And I might be dating myself a little bit here, but how many remember or ever worked with an Apple II Plus computer? 
Great, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. So in the third grade, he brought this home, and I fell in love with it. I started programming in BASIC. I was doing my spelling words on the synthesizer while all my friends were outside playing. And I'm like, this is it. I love this. I ended up getting a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science. Um, but by the time I had finished college, I was already married with two kids. I finished my degree chasing my daughters around, and they were both in diapers at the same time. So I'm sure anybody with kids can probably sympathize with that. Um, also, I was working full time, and I was not working in really a technology field. Um, I had thought, because you know, I really looked up to my father, he had brought this computer home, that I wanted to be an engineer, a civil engineer. So when I was working full time, my first full time job was doing CAD work kind of as an engineering technician, thinking this was a path I was going to take. But as I worked in that engineering office, I discovered that I wasn't as passionate about it as I hoped that I would be. And I switched my focus to computer science because that's what I really enjoyed doing. Um, I believe one of our questions came in. I mean, yes. I can't remember who sent it in, but they asked, how did you make that transition you know, from kind of your academia or your college career into the technology field? Yes. Or Thank you, Abir, for that question. Yes, great question. Really excited to see those coming in. And, for me, my first career into the field wasn't cyber related. I, that degree didn't even exist when I went to school. My first career, and I'm sure uh, many of you have done this, was doing IT support, crawling around underneath desks, you know, mm -hmm. plugging in cables, someone pulling a prank, they would swap monitor cables and say their monitor wasn't working, you know, just these crazy things, troubleshooting printers. So it wasn't anything glamorous. I didn't make that jump right out of my degree into the field or the profession that I am currently in. I kind of had to pay my dues a little bit. Uh, and also for me, one of the challenges I faced is I had two young girls that I wanted to spend time at home with. And that was something, and that's a decision that's going to be different for everybody, what kind of path they want to take. You know, do you want to stay at home with your children full time? You know, daycare, part time. How are we going to juggle this? You have this work-life balance to deal with. So as part of my career path, I did some work from home. I did contract work. I wanted to stay at home with my daughters. I wanted to help raise them, but I wanted to keep my skills current and fresh so that when I was ready to kind of re-enter that job market, I felt that I could still be marketable. So for me, um, you know, kind of a little bit of pause in my career, and when I was ready to jump back into things full time, I was looking through the want ads, looking for a job, and I found a position that said computer forensic associate. And honestly, I had no idea what forensics was. I thought it was fingerprinting, you know, the computer case, um, you know, working a crime scene, which we do in forensics. I honestly don't think I've ever fingerprinted a computer case, but I really didn't have the concept of what it was. I hadn't attended a conference like this where I could walk around and talk to all the different professionals in the field and see all the different things were out there. So my first job into computer forensics for me was almost like a one step back, two step forwards. Um, although I had experience in the IT realm probably for about a good seven or eight years when I entered, I kind of took that step backwards to break into this field because it seemed really interesting to me. And um, so the first job I took almost took me back to an entry level position. But within a year, I had, because of all the skills that I had built up, you know, working from home, doing contract work, working my full time jobs, I had built up this core set of technical skills that really helped me excel once I kind of found my passion. My first job was actually, I'm from Tucson, Arizona. Is anybody here from Tucson? Yes, okay, so my first job was working, one person, <laughs> um, my first job was working for a woman who started her own company doing forensics. She specialized in working with attorneys on civil and criminal cases. 
Uh, the first week I was in the office, she wasn't even there. She was out in a, an important case testifying. So I show up, I'm like, what am I supposed to do? I don't know anything about forensics. This is an entirely new field for me. And I found an end case manual that was sitting in a bookcase and I grabbed it and I just started teaching myself. So for the first year of my career in forensics, I was pretty much self-taught. Mm -hmm. I read books, I read blogs, I put myself you know, through the manual. I did everything I could and learn. And during this, I was like, I love forensics. Um, you know, I get to look at computers, I get to look through someone's internet history, I get to see what they're doing when they think nobody is looking and what they don't want people to know about, which is fascinating. I get to put together pieces of puzzles, figure out how a crime happened, how hackers got in, and I'm like, this is the career path for me. I love this. And I think when you're passionate about something and you find what it is that you're looking for, you know it. Kind of like that love at first sight. I know when I met my husband, I was like, this is it. This is the man for me. This is great. And pieces just kind of seem to fall into place after that. From that job, I made a move to Deloitte, a bigger company, which I really loved. Um, with consulting, there's a lot of tra uh, travel involved, and I was probably up to about 100% travel, which really wasn't working for me. So I came back to Su Tucson, and I started my own business as a consultant, um, which I absolutely loved. During this time, I had to build my own clientele, I had to do the networking, I had to do the taxes, and I found that I really missed kind of doing all the technical work and I wanted to focus on that. During this time, I started my blog, I started doing cell phone forensics, uh, and there wasn't a lot out there published on cell phone forensics, so I started a blog to kind of share my research, what I've been doing in the field, and this blog, I think, really helped get me noticed within the industry as a leader. Mm -hmm. At that time, Verizon reached out to me. They had seen my blog. And then I came on and made the tr transition from digital forensics into digital forensics and incident response. And they were willing, with my skill set, to train me up on the incident response side of things, although my background was primarily digital forensics. And then from there, I made the jump to Kroll, where I'm a director and I absolutely love it. On large-scale investigations, I lead a team of investigators. We help clients figure out how the hackers got in, what they took, and we help them remediate the situation. So that's kind of my path and my journey. Mm -hmm. it, probably different from some of, of how some of you arrived at where you're at, but um, that's how I made it, and that's where I am today. Okay, wow, some great advice for our audience. So what were the key obstacles you encountered in your career? I think some of the key uh, obstacles, one, is the opportunity for advancement. And I don't think it necessarily, in my case, had to uh, be uh, because I was a woman. There just weren't the positions above me. People just weren't moving on. There just weren't enough of them. So for me, my challenge was I kind of had to get out of my comfort zone, even though I really enjoyed where I was at what I loved doing, the people I was working with, and I had to kind of step outside of my comfort zone to look for those opportunities in other places. Okay, thank you for that. Now, I have a question for our audience. Now, please raise your hand if you were in the situation that you were the only woman in the room in a work setting. Come on, we've all been there. Hmm. So, Marie, from your experience in the executive table, what was that like and what do you do to make your voice heard? Definitely, I remember one of the very first cases I worked, um, the attackers, you're like, they're in the network, you show up and the CEO's at the table, the CIO, mm -hmm. everybody's in a tizzy and you look around and you're the only woman. <laughs> And I think, and this might be, you know, this might be my issue more than the injury's issue, but I feel like I have to prove myself coming out of the gate. I used to play basketball with the boys, right? And if you show up as the only woman, you have to be better. You cannot be, you know, you have to be better than they are just to have like this level playing field. And like I said, that might be my mentality, but maybe that's a mentality that kind of comes as part of society. I don't know if they're one in the same, but I think that's all something that we can work to overcome. Yes, well, I agree. And um, in Israel, we have this term, Israeli chutzpah, which is basically, you should say what's on your mind. You should express your opinion. And I feel we have to do it as well. So we mentioned before, 
the key barriers for women in tech. Lack of mentorship, lack of role models, gender bias, wage inequality, and, un and unequal growth opportunities. What practical advice can you share from your experience in this respect? What did you do to overcome such barriers? So I think when we talk about lack of mentors, I think it's interesting that I've offered myself out as a mentor at functions like these and events like these, but I have very little follow-up. And I'm wondering, um, maybe as women, we need to somehow make the process more welcoming. I think it can be kind of intimidating to reach out to somebody and to ask for that. I did work at a company where mentorship was part of their program. You got onboarded, you came in, and they assigned you a mentor. And I don't know if we want to be assigned a mentor, but I think that might be a good part of a career development plan to encourage more of these mentorships happening, because I don't see it happening as much as I think it should be. I, I think the opportunities are there. We just need to take them, and we need to take advantage of them, and we need to be proactive in that. Um, another thing that you mentioned, and you know that we always hear about, is this pay gap. I think mm -hmm. one of the biggest lessons I learned, and you know, it's one of those things where you kind of go back and you're like, if I could have changed one thing, what would it have been? I think I undervalued myself, and, that, and I sold myself short. Um, relationships like this at conferences where you can get a mentor and you can get someone you can confide in and you can talk to someone this field is so varied going on Glassdoor are you kidding me the salary ranges that you see you get no insight into what those people are doing on their daily lives if they're the exact job function I remember going into job interviews being clueless on what I thought I was worth and I think I I undersold myself I think it's very critical to make a mentor, to make a friend, male or female, people in the industry and in other verticals as you. And I think we have to have the frank conversations on what we're making so we know what we're worth. And without doing that, it's just a guessing game and I think we're selling ourselves short. I was very fortunate that I had some male counterparts in the industry that were willing to sell, uh, tell me their salary information and when I heard it, I was floored. I was like, I have been selling myself short I need to ask what I am worth for, what I am worth. Okay, um, this is some great advice. So, imagine you had a time machine. <laughs> what would you have done differently? So I think about the journey and the path that I took to get here, and I mentioned I started my family when I was young, and I always wonder what would have happened if I would have focused on my career and had my family later? What if I would have went right into the cyber field right out of college? I would have loved to have started this industry right off the bat, but then I kind of think about the, the butterfly effect, right? If any one of these things changed, I probably wouldn't be where I'm at today, and I'm really happy where I'm at today. I think the one thing I would have changed is what I spoke about. I think I would have done my research and made some connections earlier in my career to make sure that I knew what I was worth so that I would have had better decisions and more money <laughs> during those times yeah. in my lives. Okay, we are still in the time machine. Let's speculate a little bit about the future. How about the next generation of women leaders in this field? How would you advise your daughter if she decided she wants a career in cyber? What are the key areas of concern? So for me, of course, I have two daughters, and neither of them are interested in the technology field. Uh, one is an artist, and one prefers languages. Um, but I think one of my key concerns kind of moving forward is that we get complacent. Uh, right now, we have events like this. I kind of feel like STEM and women in cybersecurity are almost kind of like trending but I hope it's not a trend. This is a marathon that we're in. It is not a sprint. We need to keep this energy. We need to keep this focus. We need to keep things going with the youth so that this continues no matter what the trends are. Okay, so for our audience, what can they do now to learn more about a career in cyber and what it could mean for them? Do you have any networks, organization, events, even Twitter lists you can recommend for them? So if you're interested in digital forensics, um, there's something I like to follow called uh, DFIR this week. It's just like a summary of everything that's happened within the industry. Find the key people on Twitter. In cybersecurity, if you're not moving forward, you're moving backwards. Um, academia, learning, schools, reading books are great, but we have to be current on what's going on. And the current things that are happening are things that are 
that is being shared on blogs. Um, keep up on all of those type of things. Meetups, if you have a local meetup in your area, uh, start attending that. I didn't see one in Tucson, so I started one in Tucson. Um, the University of Arizona has something called CyberCats. Look around in your area, start networking, making connections, start socializing and talking with people in your industry, and keep up as much as possible on what's out there. Okay, great. So we have here a question from the audience. What is some of the biggest fires you had to put out in the workplace? So um, since I'm a consultant, a lot of the fires for me happen on the client site. Um, I work with a great team, and a lot of times you're dealing with a client, and I think a keynote speaker touched on this, when they're going through a crisis situation. And I feel kind of bad saying this, but when they're going through crisis is when I'm having the most fun. Because that's usually when the uh, hackers in their network, they're doing crazy things, we're chasing them down. I'm like, this is great. Like, I see the attacker going here and here. They're about ready to take your credit card data. They're like, no. And I'm like, this is great. They're like, no. I'm like, uh, and it's so much fun. But for me, you have have to put to them it's a fire to me I'm like this is why I got in forensics and um, but it's a crisis for them so you have to be you know aware of that and so you're really helping them kind of manage it because for you this might be something you deal with on a daily basis this could be the first time they're going through something like this and because you're used to dealing with that you bring that calmness to them and you kind of have to let them know it's okay um, the other thing is sometimes we just need a reality check um, Money's money. Uh, a lot of times when I'm working these forensics cases, I'll come home and I'll see something on the news, like what happened in London, right? Sometimes I think we need to put what we do into perspective, into the big picture. This is really terrible, what's going on with this company. This is really stressful for you, but at the end of the day, you know, you're alive. <laughs> You know, this wasn't something, I mean, I know now with all the medical devices that may change, but at the end of the day, you know, I think you're really there to help your client through this, which I think is another reason why women excel in this field, because I think we're really good at communicating those type of things. Okay, so please um, share with our audience some key critical success factors from your career. What helped you to succeed? So for me personally, I really felt my career start to excel for three main things. One, I'm passionate about what I do, and I really feel like that comes through in my work. My work day for me doesn't stop at five o'clock because I'm passionate and I feel like I found my niche. I'm constantly learning, I'm constantly growing. Um, I love to take on projects. My fun projects after work are kind of like an extension of what I do during the day. It might be research on a particular artifact I found and then writing a program for it. Um, the other thing is blogging. I can't stress enough how much blogging helped my career. It helped establish me as a leader in the industry. Uh, before employers met me, they already had a handle on what kind of technical skills I possessed by reading my blog, which meant less technical interviews. How many people here have gone through a technical interview? I mean, they're, they're torture, they're horrible, right? I don't know about you, but I mean, I feel like I'm technical. I think I am, I know I am. But when I get ready for a technical interview, I'm like sweating, I'm on the phone. I mean, they're terrible, but by having a blog, I already put my work out there for people to see, and they already have a handle on my skill set. And sometimes it's totally let me bypass, you know, doing a technical interview because I've already kind of proven myself. Um, the last thing is uh, presenting. Um, I felt like that has done a lot for my career. Speaking at industry conferences kind of establishes you as, to use the term, a thought leader, right? You're demonstrating that you have the ability to communicate, um, that you have something to say, you have a message, you have an opinion. And I think these three things are something that really help accelerate my career because especially with like blogging and presenting, you're marketing yourself. It's like free marketing that you can get out there and you can do for yourself that can really help your career. Yes, um, I totally agree and we see that in the women in tech law as well and I law that blogging is key and I do that as well. Um, and just to continue on that line, we have here a question from the audience. So what would you recommend for someone who is not a naturally great in communicating and is more, uh, but is still, you know, wanting to get involved and become a leader? Excellent question. So, for instance, I have um, this meetup group I started. If um, you don't feel comfortable presenting, I 
a need in Tucson for a meetup group. I established this meetup group um, as part of that. I have uh, other people come in and present, but now I'm seen as a leader because you know I lead this meetup group, I get presenters in, I get up, maybe I see a, cu a couple words beforehand. Um, so I'm not having to necessarily do the communicating, I do present for the group, but that's just an example of something you can kind of do to start establishing those type of skills. Um, as far as like presenting or communicating, you know, it's baby steps. <laughs> I started out, uh, this is Tucson, we have a very high retirement community, right? One of my first presentations was about digital forensics up at a retirement home. And like someone fell asleep, but I think they were 90. So I was like, that's okay, uh, that doesn't bother me too much. Uh, but so I kind of took these baby steps where the first presentations I did were not um, audiences that intimidated me so much. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I'd present for a small lunch group those type of things. So skills don't always come easy. We have to build them. We can't always take the easy road. Sometimes you have to push outside of your comfort zone a little bit, and each time you push a little bit more and a little bit more, and before you know it, you know, you're hitting that goal line. Well, I agree with you. You just have to put yourself out there. Um, okay, so along that lines, uh, our audience is asking for free top advices on becoming a, you know, a lawyer or a consultant in the data privacy area, and we would like to hear your three key takeaways tip for women in cyber. So I'm not really part of the data privacy realm, but um, I can give some very tough advice. Um, like I said, my path wasn't right out of college into my dream job. I think um, as an employer, uh, we like to look for you know, hands-on technical skills, problem solving. Um, so your first job out of college may not be your cushy dream job, but it may be the one that gets you the skills that's going to get you to where you need to go in a couple of years. OK, great. Um, so we have additional uh, questions from our audience. Did you find out cyber forensics was your passion at the actual job site or learning about it in school or reading online about it? So I found out at the job site, um, you know, I really didn't know what computer forensics was. I think before the, the day before the interview, I did some research and then within, you know, I just showed up and like I said, that first week, my boss was gone and I started to really dig in and figure out what it was. So for me, it happened more on the job. Um, I didn't know what the field was. It was new to me. I was lucky to somehow land a job doing it. And when that happened, I was like, this is it. This is what I really love to do. But you are at a conference where you get to talk to people. Now they have classes in forensics. And I've already talked to a couple people in my mentoring session last night. They were like, I took a class in forensics, and I loved it. And I could already see like that passion developing in their eyes. And whether it's forensics, cybersecurity, uh, you know, any of these other fields, I think something kind of happens when you find what it is that you want to be passionate about. It took me seven years to get there. It may not happen right away. You may not figure it out right away, or you may not get that experience that lets you know what you want to do right away. So I think it's okay not to know for a little bit, but if you know you want to be in the technology area, find jobs where you're growing out your skill set while you kind of figure out what your path is. Okay, so let's sum it up. Give us our, you know, free top, you know, takeaways words for our, for our audience. Definitely. Find, and this is kind of a common theme that I'm hearing from a lot of the speakers, find what it is what, that you're passionate about because I think once that happens, it's very easy to excel in your career because you're going to find that you're going to do those extra things to make you stand out. Because you're passionate and because you love it so much, it's just not going to feel like work. Uh, the next thing, and I kind of touched on this already, is do something to set yourself apart from others. For me, it was the blogging, presenting. I also do coding, and on the team that I worked on, uh, people weren't really doing coding. So I was able to use and leverage Python to automate some tasks that were going on within the team. So find out what it is about you that makes you special and then really hone in and develop that and be the go-to person for that specific task. You don't have to be the go-to task for everything, but make sure you're known for at least one go-to thing that makes you valuable to the team. And the other thing is, Push yourself outside of your comfort zone, whether that's taking a speaking engagement you think you may not be quite ready yet for, or um, you know maybe switching jobs so now you have that opportunity for advancement. Okay, great. So please join us, join me in thanking our speaker. And one last request 
Can I get it? One last request. Since I am a student here on a scholarship, I'm going to join the photo competition. So let's do that selfie. Oh. We'd like to take a selfie with you in the background, if that's OK. <laughs> Consent. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.